Today, let's explore the warrior's ethos. To guide us through this discussion, we'll use Stephen Pressfield's novel, Gates of Fire. But before we turn to the novel, I want to take a, a look at a passage from Dr. King. In this passage, uh, Dr. King states, an individual has not begun to live until he can rise above the narrow horizons of his particular individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity. And this is one of the big problems of life that so many people never quite get to the point of rising above self. So they end up in the tragic victims of self-centeredness. They are the people who live in eternal I. For you see, a child is inevitably necessary egocentric. He's a bundle of his own sensations, clamoring to be cared for. When people become mature, they are to rise above this. When one matures, he turns himself to higher loyalties. He gives himself something to something outside of himself. He gives himself to causes that he lives for and sometimes will even die for. Them. He comes to the point that now he can rise above his individualistic concerns. And so you see people who are apparently selfish, it isn't merely an ethical issue, but it's a psychological issue. They are victims of arrested development. And they are still children. They haven't grown up. So the essence of a warrior that we, that we find here in the novel and that Dr. King kind of references here is this idea of uh, being other-oriented, rising above the self, okay? I think there's a passage that we'll, we'll, we'll turn to to get us uh, maybe some context or some additional framework, and I think we'll, we'll be surprised to see that uh, this passage here in Gates of Fire is still very similar to what Dr. King had to say. When I first came to Lacadamian, and they called me suicide. I hated it. But in time, I came to see its wisdom, unintentional as it was. For what can be more noble than to slay oneself, not literally with a blade in the guts, but to extinguish the selfish self within, that part which looks only to its own preservation, to save its own skin? That, I saw, was the victory you Spartans had gained over yourselves. That was the glue. It's what you had learned, and it made me stay to learn it too. When a warrior fights not for himself, but for his brothers, when his most passionately sought goal is neither glory nor his own life preservation, but to spend his substance for them, his comrades, not to abandon them, not to prove unworthy of them, that his heart truly has achieved contempt for death. And with that, he transcends himself, and his actions touch the sublime. This is why the true warrior cannot speak of battle save to his brothers who have been there with him. This truth is too hotly, too holy, too sacred for words. I myself would not presume to give it speech, save here now with you. So we're going to try to talk about something today that uh, is potentially too sacred or too holy um, for those of us who haven't experienced it, but I still uh, think it's a worthwhile endeavor to kind of understand or explore uh, this warrior ethos. The first thing we can kind of uh, need to understand about warrior cultures is that they generally have an indoctrination. The Spartans had the agogi. Uh, there's a scene specifically where Alexandros uh, neglects his shield, which to the Spartans was considered the most important piece of gear or equipment because it was used to protect the person to your left or to your right. So in this scene, the drill instructor, uh, who's represented by Polynikes, um, and Pressfield essentially gives us a front row seat uh, to an at times hilarious and comical but also brutal hazing session of a young recruit. He says, uh, what is this? It's a shield, Lord. Polynikes declared that's impossible. It can't be a shield, I'm certain of that. His voice carried powerfully in the amphitheater. Because not even the dumbest buttfuck shitworm of a Patreon would leave a shield laying face down where he couldn't snatch it up when the enemy came upon him. He towered above the mortified boy. It's a chamber pot, Polynikes declared. Fill it. Thus the torture began. So, Pressfield, a, a Marine, uh, an 0311, and uh, he might be kind of relaying one of his stories uh, from boot camp kind of here in, in this passage. And, but again, I think uh, whether you look at Modern examples, whether it's the Navy SEALs, you've got to go to BUDS, or you kind of look at the Rangers, uh, you've got to go to Ranger School. 
most warrior cultures have some kind of indoctrination where you kind of strip away the civilian and you kind of inculcate this, this warrior spirit. Before we continue to kind of explore uh, what it means to be a warrior and, and the warrior ethos, maybe we should try to understand well, why uh, do we need warriors. I would argue because Clausewitz tells us uh, we need warriors because two people, typically diplomats and statesmen, uh, have failed to reach an agreement. And they believe so strongly in their position that they're willing to violate one of the integral moral fabrics that hold societies together. They're willing to kill. Not them, of course, but they're willing to send someone to kill and die on their behalf. War, or more accurately historically described as the slaughter of young men, is a spectacular failure of society. In war, you reward violent behavior, and he who is the most violent receives the highest accolades. Well, what does violence look like when we talk about violence? Pressfield's going to tell us a little bit about what that violence uh, might look like. Because when we think about war, I think it's uh, too abstract. It's, just, it's, it's just something we study a lot, but it's kind of this abstract concept. Uh, so what's the kind of chief characteristic, then, of war? And I would say the most enduring chief char characteristic of war is violence. Okay? Uh, so let's look specifically at violence. This is, again, Polynikes talking to Alexandros, one of the recruits at the Agogi. He says, killing a man is like fucking. You feel like God at that moment, exercising the right only he and the warrior in combat experience, that of dealing death, of losing another man's soul and sending it down to hell. You want to savor it, to twist the blade deeper, and pull the man's heart and guts out upon the iron point of your spear. But you can't. Tell me why because I must move on and slay the next man. Are you going to weep now? No, Lord. What will you do when the Persians come? Slay them, Lord. Pressfield uses this kind of sexualized metaphor to describe the violence because it connotes the intimacy of war. For those of us fighting in them, it's not something happening over there or a thousand miles away. It's close. It's personal something that you can feel. At times, Pressfield borders on romanticizing war. And at one point, uh, Alexandros, again, is re uh, this, this recruit at the Agogi is forced to recite the pleasures of war. Polynikes ordered Alexandros to recite the pleasures of war, to which the boy responded by rote, citing the satisfaction of shared hardship, of triumph over adversity, of camaraderie in Philadelphia, love of one's comrades and arms. And so maybe that's the, the primary kind of concept uh, of this novel is this, this idea of Philadelphia or brotherly love. But here in lies the warrior's dilemma. We possess a desire for shared hardship. We want to conquer adversity. We want to slay the dragon. And there's a love for your brother that's so unique and special. Joseph Campbell writes extensively on warrior archetypes and the hero's journey. And Sebastian Younger details this topic uh, around an inherent longing for a tribe and a shared sacrifice. Um, but the rules of war are simple. And maybe one of my snipers put, put it best, Sergeant Matabate most aptly summarizes them uh, in what he calls the three rules of war. Rule number one, young warriors die. Rule number two, you cannot change rule number one. Rule number three, someone must walk the point. And so there you have it. Young warriors die. And they die in droves. And sometimes it's really difficult to understand uh, the necessity of their death. So what develops is this bifurcated tension of the warrior. We have these things that we desire and long for. We understand these pleasures of war. But at the same time, we recognize rule number one, that young warriors die. Something that 
many of us uh, keep this up in the late hours trying to understand or reflect or kind of reconcile that tension. Spartans teach us a number of lessons uh, that I think are worth visiting. Okay? Maybe one of the first lessons that Spartans teach us that we don't teach that well, I think, within the military is, is talking about phobos or fear. How do you deal with fear? Okay? The Spartans had a discipline they called phobologia, the science of fear, meaning they study the actual fear. Okay? The individual warriors are studying fear, and it's, and it's something that's broadly discussed and taught while at the Agogi. So the Spartans tell us that fear spawns in the body and must be combated there. For once the flesh is seized, or a loop of fear begins, feeding upon itself, it mounts into a runaway of terror. You put the uh, body into a state of aphobia, fearlessness, the Spartans believed, and the mind will follow. So we're studying phobos, and we want to try to get to aphobia, or a, a lack of fear. Okay? And this is maybe a little uh, foreshadowing of this idea of, of a lack of fear. What is a lack of fear? Is one going to be the enduring kind of question that, that moves through this now? So after the Spartans would finish a battle, they would do something called fear shedding. And here's kind of how Crestfield describes it. All up and down the line, one beheld warriors clustering in groups of twos and threes as the terror they had managed to hold at bay throughout the battle now slipped its bonds and surged upon them, overwhelming their hearts. Clasping their comrades by the hand, they knelt, not from reverence alone, though that was an element abundant, but because the strength had suddenly fled from their knees, which they could no longer support them. Many whipped, others shuddered violently. This was not regarded as effeminate, but termed in Doric idiom as purging or fear shedding. So it's interesting that uh, not only Spartans, but many warrior cultures throughout history have had some kind of uh, specific process or methodology for kind of dealing with fear or trauma. And for those of us who have come back from combat zones, there is some kind of transition briefs, mostly in the form of a PowerPoint uh, but we don't really spend time with a specific kind of ceremony or ritual that helps us kind of process or move through this. The Spartans also had a unique way, uh, actually not so unique, but a very specific way of how they dealt with loss. People often ask, like, what, what do you do, how do you deal with, with when you lose a, uh, a Marine or a soldier? And, and I think the, the Spartans had it right. Leonidas took out each unclaimed ticket and read the name. He offered no eulogy. No word was spoken but the name. Among the Spartans, this alone is considered the purest form of consecration. Alcamenes, Damon, Antilides, Lysandros, and on down the list. Those of you who have attended a memorial may be familiar with the idea of the final roll call. And so at least in the Marines, what we do at the memorial ceremony is the company first sergeant, the battalion uh, sergeant major, we've got the formation. And we'll usually have the, the battle crosses or, uh, with the inverted uh, rifle, Kevlar, the boots, the dog tag. And what the first sergeant or that senior enlisted will do is they'll call out the names of some of the Marines who are present. So you'll say, Lance Corporal Adams, present. Corporal Johnson, present. Corporal Williams, present. And after several iterations of Marines uh, calling present, you begin to go uh, down the line of the fallen. And when I got back from my second deployment, my, from my first deployment, and we had 25 killed in action, and we were up at the Hilo landing zone on the landing pad in San Mateo. Sergeant Major Bushway stepped in front of the formation, and for 25 games, 
This is how it went. Lance Corporal Benagua. Lance Corporal Arden Benagua. Lance Corporal Arden B. Benagua. And in that silence, and in that absence, you feel their presence. And as you can imagine, as you go down the line with 25 people, rank, last name, rank, first name, last name, rank, first name, middle initial, last name. Calling the attention to their absence is sufficiently uh, powerful to remind us all um, and to kind of adequately eulogize them during a memorial ceremony. And the best, and, and you know, the, the next thing that you do after you do this memorial ceremony and during the memorial ceremony after it's concluded the official aspects of it, uh, you will cry and you will laugh and you'll talk about uh, funny stories of, of stuff that happened with your buddy. But the best thing you can do is then get your Marines back in the fight. Where I've seen this kind of go awry or um, potentially negatively is when units take some casualties uh, and they kind of start to go firm. And they start to allow themselves to kind of construe the enemy as, as 10 feet tall and they kind of adopt maybe a more uh, victim mentality and they become essentially paralyzed or, or internal and combat ineffective. You know, uh, every time I took an L, every time I took a loss, the best remedy was then to go out there and get a W and get a big W. You know, I remember uh, on November 9th, it was a very tough morning, uh, finding out first that a good buddy of mine, Robert Kelly, was killed in action, and then uh, I had a, a casualty. One of my one of my machine gunners, uh, Sergeant Michaels, was wounded. So we launched a quick reaction force, and the quick reaction force went out, and we got those guys back. And uh, as we started to break down and, and return to base, the rear of my patrol came under heavy fire, and. I was in the front of the patrol, and I started to run to the, to the rear of the patrol, and my platoon sergeant was just outside of that kind of ambush zone, so he was kind of uh, towards the rear, but, but just outside of the ambush, and, he, and so we were all started to kind of converge on where my squad leader was, Sergeant Humphrey. And as the three of us converged, Sergeant Humphrey stepped on an IED. And I was blown up one way, uh, my platoon sergeant was blown up another way, and uh, after a couple moments, regained consciousness, and uh, I see that Corporal Leahy, the first team leader, has already stepped up, is already kind of working the medevacs, already set in the security posture, and so I um, moved to, to assess the casualties, and I see uh, Sergeant Humphrey there. He's missing his leg, and the only thing he has is uh, kind of two bones sticking out from his knee. And then his, his other leg, it's from his knee to the top of his boot, it's just the bone. All the skin, the fat, the muscle is, is gone. And then I look to my platoon sergeant, uh, a man whom I loved very dearly, Staff Sergeant Henley at the time, now First Sergeant Henley. And he's yelling because he can't hear and he can't get, get up uh, because his eardrums are blown out. And so here I am looking at my first squad leader, uh, a Marine I love very dearly and a friend, and I'm my platoon sergeant who uh, maybe I've not had any more greater admiration, respect, or love for any other man in my life like I've had for, for my, my platoon sergeant. And as I look at both of them pretty severely wounded, uh, I go and I start to begin uh, treating the casualties. 
uh, Sergeant Humphrey. And so what I would like to do is when I had a casualty, uh, once I had the medevac in motion and, and the security kind of set, I would always pull off one of their junior Marines and, and stick my hand in their guts so that they didn't have to, to do that. So I get my hand there down in his guts and we're, we're patching him up. And the first thing that any Marine uh, who suffers a lower extremity injury is going to ask you is, uh, is everything still there? Uh, and once you assure them of that, they kind of calm down a lot, okay? So, yep, you're still going to be able to stay in the fight down there, uh, all good. And as soon as I gave him that assurance, he began to say, I'm sorry, sir. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I stepped on that IED. And uh, I was trying to tell him, a uh, Humphrey, maybe now is not the time that you don't need to feel super sorry about anything. And no, no, sir, I can't believe I did. I said, hey, man, uh, he's like, I stepped off the path. I should have known. Um, hey, uh, we're not going to worry about that right now, but uh, we're going to worry about just kind of getting you patched back up and, and, and getting you to a higher echelon of care. So uh, we got them kind of patched up as much as we can there. Uh, great work by my corpsman, as always. And we've got a polis litter, and uh, there's, there's four of us on the litter. I'm in the, I'm in the front of the litter, and we're, we're walking up to where uh, we're going to set up the, the landing zone to bring in the helicopter. And as we're walking, he keeps, he keeps telling us, hey, hey guys, I know I'm really heavy which was true, he's a bigger guy. Uh, I know I'm really heavy. Why don't you guys just, uh, just take a break, put me down. Uh, I know this must be really tough for you guys. And I'm thinking, you know, here is a guy who's missing his leg, has shrapnel all over his body. His other leg is eviscerated. And his only thought in that moment is about our well-being. Someone who would go on to nearly die uh, while he was flying out of the country, who required dozens of surgeries, in that moment, as he's approaching his death, his only thought, hey guys, I know I'm heavy, sir. Why don't you go ahead and just put us, put us down? Talk about other-oriented. Talk about Philadelphia, a brotherly love. Coming back to how do we kind of properly mourn and then uh, how do we transition from that mourning. Uh, I got back, uh, I got evaluated by the, the IDC or HM1, was pretty messed up, recommended to medevac. Uh, I'm thinking, well, I just lost my platoon sergeant, I just lost my squad leader, uh, I'm definitely not leaving. I said, okay, you need to take away at least a week off. I said, okay, roger that. Uh, with no intention of complying with that order. So I pulled my Marines in, said, hey, this is a bad day. Uh, tomorrow we seek Humphrey's revenge. And so I planned a patrol right into the hornet's nest, uh, did some really detailed kind of tactical uh, planning with my, with my squad leaders, and we went right back in the next day and absolutely stacked bodies. And so we came back and within 24 hours, we still feel the, 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 the weight of that loss, but we recognize, hey, uh, we have a vote, and uh, we aren't going to kind of allow ourselves to be kind of become victims of this scenario. Uh, we'll, we're going to maintain kind of our, our, our warrior mindset, and we're going to keep going out there and keep kicking ass. Uh, maybe in a little addendum to that story. Days later, uh, a resupply helicopter lands, and who comes off the back of the helicopter? none other than Staff Sergeant Henley, 
who still can't even really walk because his eardrums are all blown out. He has no equilibrium. And he says, hey, sir, uh, first of all, I said, like, what the fuck are you doing here? And he says, well, I'm back. I'm good. So you sure don't look like you're good. He's like, no, sir, uh, I had to get out of there. I had to get back with the boys. Uh, when's the next patrol? Make sure you throw me on the, the patrol manifest. Now, success, Sergeant. We walk in ranger file because of all the IEDs here, and you can't, there's, you walk like you're uh, severely intoxicated. There's no way uh, we're taking you out on the next patrol. Um, he said, okay, roger that, sir. Also with no intent to kind of comply, gets himself on the next manifest, and the next day we're out doing a, a, a three-day clearing operation called uh, Operation Outlaw Wrath. And who's out there hooking and jabbing with us? Sassard Henley. The same guy who, when he was a squad leader in Fallujah in 04 during Phantom Fury with 3 5 as well, gets shot as they're returning to base, turns around, doesn't realize he's shot, turns around and says, Y'all better stop throwing rocks back there. Continues to patrol, goes back to their uh, birthing area, and someone says, Hey, Sergeant, uh, it looks like there's a lot of blood on the back of your trousers. Turns out, he's shot in the ass, Go, gets uh, medevac, they try to send him back to stateside, he refuses, and again, is back within his platoon within a couple days. Just like they tried to send him back stateside when he was wounded in Afghanistan. Here's a guy who was in the two most deadly battles, two of the most deadly battles in Iraq and Afghanistan, with a one-way ticket back to the, to the states. And his overwhelming desire is to be back with his platoon. Spartans also teach us the role of an officer. So if we go to page 112, I watched Dionykes reforming the rank of his platoon, listing their losses and summoning aid for the wounded. The Spartans have a term for the state of mind which must at all costs be shunned in battle. They call it catalepsis, possession, meaning the derangement of senses that comes with when terror or anger usurps dominion of the mind. This, I realize now, watching Dionykes rally and tend to his men, was the role of the officer. To prevent those under his command at all stages of battle, before, during, after, from becoming possessed. To fire their valor when it flagged and rein in their fury when it threatened to take them out of hand. This was Dionyke's job. That was why he wore the transverse crested helmet of an officer. So the idea of the officer is to avoid the possession, to maintain uh, the self-composure, and to fire them when they're afraid and rein them in when they've kind of become lost to rage. I remember being in a pretty gnarly ambush where we were caught out in the open. Uh, this was an L-shaped ambush and the enemy had grazing fire and there was no cover, there was no concealment out in the, in the middle of a field that had just been, um, they had just cut all the corn so there's nothing there at the time. So we're down on the ground, kind of returning some fire, but no one can is willing to move. No one's willing to kind of pop their head up. And I'm uh, I'm looking around, and all I see uh, are you know 20 other guys, all kind of just looking in my direction. And I'm not a big fan of uh, the idea. You know, people like to say like, "What now, Lieutenant?" Because I think uh, it's overdone and kind of becomes kind of annoying. But uh, it is true. It is true. They were looking at me like, what are we going to do? And uh, I recognized we were going to have a very difficult time achieving any kind of fire superiority uh, from this tactical uh, position that we are in and that we had to move uh, in order to uh, achieve a place where we can start to effectively suppress, assess, move, and kill, right? 
So, uh, somebody's got to be the first guy up. Somebody's got to get everybody moving. And uh, in that moment, here I, there I was, stand up and uh, start kind of just doing the old follow me, grabbing people on the way, moving us into a canal so that we can uh, start to maneuver uh, on the enemy, okay? Uh, that's when you, that's firing them, that's firing the will, right? F firing them when they lack the will, firing them forward, okay? I remember on uh, December 28th, 2010, we were on a big clearing operation and uh, I was dealing with some drama uh, in, in kind of one part of this, this little village and my Marines call me and they say, hey sir, uh, we swept into this building there seems to be IEDs everywhere. Um, we've got EOD with us. Can you send EOD uh, up to this position? I said, yep, uh, just go firm, form a security uh, circle. I'll be over there as soon as I'm done dealing with this. I uh, called EOD, EOD was in route. As EOD approached uh, this compound and as I approached the compound, kind of we, we, we were converging at the same time, um, an IED went off. Maybe I'll back this story up a little bit. Prior to this IED going off, when those Marines set in that security uh, 360 around this compound, one of my machine gunners uh, turned to his uh, section leader and said, uh, hey, Sergeant, I see a guy who is definitely spotting us. Um, I want to shoot him. And this 240 gunner, uh, if it was a week prior, would never have asked that question. Uh, because within that week, the rules of engagement uh, were, were tightened up. And um, because they were kind of a hostile intent and hostile act were now kind of interpreted a little bit differently. Whereas before, we all understood that if you were out while the Marines were on patrol, watching the patrol, uh, you were considered... Uh, that was kind of hostile, enough, enough of a hostile intent, hostile act to kind of engage. Well, uh, under the new kind of interpretation of that, that, that wasn't going to be permissible. So whereas, again, a week ago, he would have just opened up with a good burst on that guy. Uh, because we're Marines and, and we follow orders, he turns to the sergeant to, to kind of get confirmation. The sergeant, because he's a good Marine and he follows kind of order, says, well, no, not, that's, that's no go now. That guy disappears behind the wall. Moments later, uh, he detonates the IED. So up until that point, in saying we had found, you know, hundreds of pressure plates IEDs, command wire IEDs, um, but no IEDs uh, were remote controlled IEDs. So that guy was most definitely a trigger man and, and initiated that ID probably with a cell phone, garage door opener or something. And the ID was hanging up in a tree uh, about 10, 10 feet away from where Corporal Tevin Nguyen was in the prone. And just a little fragment from that IED nicked Corporal Tevin Nguyen's carotid artery. So again, as I'm walking up, the explosion goes off. The EOD guy actually takes uh, some shrapnel to the face, but it's just not too bad. Uh, get over to Corporal Nguyen. Uh, Doc Long and I arrive kind of at the same time. Quickly uh, understand that there's not going to be anything we can do. So a carotid bleed. Uh, there's, you can apply pressure but uh, it's just going to be a minute or two. And here was Doc Long, one of his closest friends within the platoon, now our 19th casualty, now the, the, now the third Marine that he will have had his hands or guts in who is going to lose his life. And uh, right there, I watched as Doc began to kind of break down. So I kind of had to do a little bit of comforting uh, of, of Doc, and then I... Uh, worked on setting up the landing zone and um, I took the squad, first squad, uh, to the building where we saw the spotter. 
Okay, so first squad, Kevin Nguyen was, was in first squad. So I mentioned first squad earlier, that was Sergeant Humphrey's squad. Okay, uh, so they've already lost their squad leader. They've already lost their combat engineer who's attached to the, uh, their squad, who I'm going to talk about in a minute. Uh, now, another one of their, now one of their team leaders uh, killed in action. So when we arrive at that compound, the guy who we observe spotting is, of course, not there. Uh, but there's a, four military-age males. One appears to probably be the dad, some teenage sons. And we say, hey, uh, where was the guy you know, who was just here? Why are you continually enabling and supporting the Taliban? Uh, a couple of the, the standard questions. And we received the standard replies. No one was here. I'm just a farmer. I don't know what you're talking about. Well, that answer is, was the kind of routine answer we would always receive. We would be shot at from somebody's compound. We would assault that compound. By the time we get there, the Taliban would already be gone on their dirt bikes. Uh, we'd get there, and we would go up on the roof, and we'd find a pile of brass from where they were just firing at us. It had the police up their brass. And we would tell you know, the, the guy, like, hey, what's going on? Uh, where's this guy coming from? Where are they going? Why are you letting them use your place? They'd say, oh, there's no Taliban here. I'm just a farmer. And I'd say, motherfucker, there's brass on your roof. We were just being shot at from here. The Taliban was here. Sorry, sir, no Taliban, just a farmer. So when we went into that compound that day and we received that same tired reply, uh, something snapped. And uh, I watched at my Marines, the, the, first off, those teenage boys that were there were kind of, they were being very belligerent. Um, and tensions started to escalate very, very rapidly. And it became quickly apparent that uh, we were looking, my Marines were looking for uh, blood for blood, that this was going to be a blood exchange, that the only thing that was going to satiate their rage or their anger uh, was some type of blood offering. And I had to kind of start to intercede, pull the reins back. And it was uh, this idea this, that was never verbalized, but their countenance kind of expressed, hey, you're with us or you're against us. Uh, and I'm kind of saying, well, of course I am with you. Of course I am angry. And of course I am sad. And of course uh, I would actually like to kill these people, but we're not going to do that. And that was uh, one of the more difficult days that I had as a platoon commander. There were several days that, uh, that no amount of training could have ever prepared me for, but maybe this was one of them. And uh, as I was able to kind of de-escalate the situation, um, you just had a group of normal, good kids who were very much on the verge of what could have been uh, a massacre. But it wasn't. No one died. Uh, no one was killed that day besides my Marine. Uh, but that, again, when we come back to the role of the officer, the self-composure, the pulling of the reins. Another little piece about uh, officers that, that Pressfield kind of talks about is, uh, but he talks about it in a subversive way, the idea that rank has its privilege. R-H-I-P, rank has its privilege. And here we kind of learn uh, what a servant leader looks like. He says, I will tell his majesty what a king is. A king does not abide within his tent while his men bleed and die upon the field. 
A king does not dine while his men go hungry, nor sleep when they stand at watch upon the wall. A king does not command his men's loyalty through their fear, nor purchase it with gold. He earns their love by the sweat of his own back and the pain he endures for their sake. That which compromises the harshest burden, a king lifts first and sets down last. A king does not require service of those he leads, but provides it to them. He serves them, not they him. So we sometimes uh, might think that uh, we are maybe entitled or special or rate something as, as, as officers. And I will tell you, what you rate is the greatest measure and portion of hardship. When there is shared misery to go around, you uh, take the largest swath of that mi misery. When there's a shit sandwich uh, that everybody's got to, uh, that we've got to eat, and in this rare instance, the officer eats first and comes up for seconds, right? That is, is kind of the idea uh, of what we rate, is the greatest portion of the hardships, the greatest portion of adversity, and in that we become servant leaders. That is the privilege of our race. The Spartans teach us uh, how to steal our heart and mind for battle. Okay. Again, when we talk about maybe we're lacking some of these kind of rituals uh, or ceremonies that might help us mentally, cognitively prepare for things or accept things, like we've talked about maybe already with, with uh, fear or trauma. Um, here's another kind of little bit of a ceremony uh, that they use that helps prepare their mind, prepare themselves mentally. So before they would go into battle, they had these twig bracelets, and they would break uh, the bracelet, and they would put them into half of that bracelet into a uh, basket, and they would retain the other half. You can kind of think of it as modern-day dog casts. So that if you became so disfigured from the battle, uh, your buddies could come around and, and, and match up that broken half of the twig and, and be able to kind of recognize that this is who this person was. But there was a much deeper significance to this act. Here's what Pestfield said. As they broke the twig, that half of him, the best part, of a man sets aside and leaves behind. He banishes from his heart all feelings of tenderness and mercy, all compassion and kindness, all thought or concept of the enemy as a man, a human being like himself. He marches into battle, bearing only the second portion of himself, the baser, the baser measure, that half which knows slaughter and butchery and turns the blind-eyed quarter. He could not fight at all if he did not do this. So this idea that we leave uh, our humanity, the things that we understand in a normal functioning society, uh, we, we break that part and we've now become back to the, the animal kingdom, right? We've become back to our base versions of ourselves, just mere animals. And when you are an animal, you're able to then uh, thrive in the butchery, in the slaughter, in the savagery. Whereas if at that moment you were still trying to hang on to aspects of your humanity, it would very much complicate that. So you leave that in the basket and you, you leave that stuff at home and then you enter the battle as a kind of uh, more baser version. And I can tell you that uh, there was one specific experience that uh, I had not broken the bracelet when I showed up to combat. It, it took me about a week in, in losing one of my best friends. And in that morning of my best friend, uh, I was so devastated uh, that as I kind of rose from that devastation, kind of out of the ashes, uh, I had burned away those more humane elements of my former self. And moving forward, uh, as I lost more friends and I lost Marines, it wasn't that I didn't mourn them or wasn't uh, sad um, or angry but I was able to compartmentalize those things to say these are, these are something to be dealt with at a different time and place because uh, in order to thrive in the slaughter, I can't be tap, 
regularly kind of tapping into these, these more human emotions. Um, they will only kind of complicate my ability to perform what I need to do. So there's one kind of, uh, Brian Shantosh, a, a Navy Cross recipient um, from 3.5, what he talks about is you kind of put this stuff in boxes. And so as, you, as these things emerge, you just kind of say, I need to kind of compartmentalize, I gotta pack them up, put them in a box, send them away, because uh, I don't have time to kind of deal with this thing that's going on right now. And I think that is an effective method. The issue comes when you continue to be busy or too busy to kind of unpack those boxes. And so you start with a closet full of boxes, and then you've got a garage full of boxes, and before you know it, you got a warehouse full of boxes, and then the tempo keeps going and keeps going. Uh, and then all of a sudden, one day, uh, some of those boxes end up back uh, on your front porch. And uh, whether you like it or not, now it's time to unpack that box. And uh, it's when you stunt, or uh, when you kind of uh, truncate that ability or, or that. The willing, or, or when you start to lack that willingness to kind of feel these things because these feelings uh, or these emotions are distractions, when you continually blunt that nerve, uh, you perhaps start to deaden it. And what it does is it, uh, it then becomes harder when you do go home, it's harder to kind of reattach uh, and make that connection um, when you're so kind of used to cutting it or cleaving away any of those kind of emotions or feelings. It, uh, you might end up becoming more comfortable uh, existing in that kind of state than uh, that more humane state where we, we can experience our emotions at a more full spectrum. So the, maybe the, the, the most important question and the most important kind of that, that theme that I alluded to earlier is the Spartans are going to keep asking, you know, uh, uh, what is the opposite of fear? What is this state phobia? And the final kind of, finally what they, the, the answer they arrive at famously in the, in the novel, maybe the most famous kind of passage is, is the opposite of fear is love. And so let's explore that. And so the following examples aren't war stories, rather they're love stories. Here are a few profiles we can start by reverting back to Sergeant Abate's rule number three, someone has to walk forward. We've mentioned him before, and I mentioned him when I said one of the, 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 the engineer from 1st Platoon was, was also killed in action, and Lance Corporal Artem Managua, deployed at, at 18 years old, San Jose, California, first generation American, and uh, he, at that time, Sengen was a minefield, an absolute minefield, IEDs everywhere. The combat engineer squad that was attached to Kiel Company, 3-5, had 13 Marines. 12 of the 13 Marines in that squad were wounded or killed. Many of those wounded are amputees. We could look at guys like uh, engineers from that, that squad. Uh, uh, you've got Spivey, Yazi, number of uh, engineers from that squad missing, their, missing limbs, okay? And then you have a, a number of those that, that squad actually killed in action. So when the entire squad is killed uh, or wounded in action, and you know that you're walking point in a minefield, and that statistically it is no longer a matter of if, but when, because you're swinging a metal detector uh, to, as your only thing between you and that IED, and here's the rub, the IEDs were generally non-metallic. So unless you hit the battery, which was often offset from the IED itself, from the plate, from the charge, uh, you were essentially, that was a completely useless tool. You were just swinging it for kind of peace of mind, but it actually uh, 
provided you very little protection. And so there was no uh, more dangerous job in 2010 than a combat engineer's um, in staying in Afghanistan. But here's the thing about Lance Corporal Benagua. He never once complained, never once said, sir, but, never once thought about himself, never once adopted a pessimistic or cynical attitude, maintained a smile on his face, and would go out there and swing that stick and walk point uh, all the way to the point that shortly, uh, not too long after turning 19, he literally, quite literally, had his head blown. What compels a young man to move forward, to walk point in an IED field? We'll come back. We can look to Lieutenant Baldermo Lopez who landed at Inchon as a young platoon commander. Here's his Medal of Honor citation. With his platoon, First Lieutenant Lopez was engaged in the reduction of immediate enemy beach defenses after landing with the assault wave. Exposing himself to hostile fire, he moved forward alongside a bunker and prepared to throw a hand grenade into the next pillbox whose fire was pinning down this, that sector of the beach. Taken under fire by an enemy automatic weapon and hit in the right shoulder and chest as he lifted to throw his arm, he fell backward and dropped the deadly missile. After a moment, he turned and dragged his body forward in an effort to retrieve the grenade and throw it. In critical condition from pain and loss of blood and unable to grasp the hand grenade firmly enough to hurl it, he chose to sacrifice himself rather than endanger the lives of his men and with a sweeping motion of his wounded right arm, cradled the grenade under him and absorbed the full impact of the explosion. On the evening prior to the landing uh, at Inchon, Lopez, again, a first generation American, wrote his father a letter. In the letter he wrote, my business is out here in the Far East where the present international crisis is located. Knowing that the profession of arms calls for many hardships and many risks, I feel that you all are now prepared for any eventuality. If you catch yourself starting to worry, just remember that no one forced me to accept my commission in the Marine Corps. This is uh, absolute extreme ownership. It's a refusal of pity. It's the epitome of what a warrior is. He said, you are now, you should now be preparing yourself for any eventuality. That eventuality he's referring to is his death. And he's telling his parents, prepare yourself for any eventuality. But don't worry because no one made me do this. I alone am the one who accepted my commission. What is so confounding about these stories is that if you told these men the outcome ahead of time, they would go. They would still go. Every single one of them would still go. If you said, this is going to be the result of this thing that you're about to do, every one of them would still go. As the Apostle Thomas said in the Gospel of John, let us go so that we may die. Knowing the outcome, knowing that going, what that would result in, Thomas went. Knowing that they would go, knowing the outcome ahead of time, Abate would still go, Donnelly would still go, Kelly would still go, Catherine would still go, Tawny would still go, they would all still go knowing ahead of time. And you may wonder, what could possibly compel a man in his final moments to conduct himself in a manner that is so utterly and completely selfless? We'll 
look at one more passage from Gates of Fire. Here is what you do, friends. Forget country, forget king, forget wife and children and freedom. Forget every concept, however noble, that you imagine you fight for here today. And act for this alone, for the man who stands at your shoulder. He is everything, and everything is contained within him. That is all I know. That's all I can tell you. When you're in the last hundred yards, when you're closing that distance, you aren't thinking about any kind of more noble pursuits. You act for this alone, for the man to your left and to your right. Because everything that is good and holy that you know about the world in that moment is contained within him. That is why they would still go. We talk about Philadelphia, brotherly love. That's it. That's why they do it. That's why we do it. It's a sense of belonging to something that will outlive your own mortality that gives people a light to live by and a flame to mark their path. What is the opposite of fear is love. And love initiates. Love sacrifices. There is no fear in love. We'll take one more look at an example of love. Corporal Jason Dunham, Kilo 37, in Iraq. Large grenade threat in the area that they're operating. And uh, this story is, is recounted in, in, a, in, a, in a Jocko podcast with Lieutenant Colonel Gibson, his company commander at the time, and tells the story. How that back in the, in the birthing area, in the squad bay, Corporal Jason Dunham, the squad leader, is uh, taking off his Kevlar and hitting the deck. Takes the Kevlar off and hits the deck. And some of his Marines say, like, you know, Corporal, what are you, what are you doing? Or his buddies say, what are you, what are you, you know, Dunham, what do you think you're doing? And he says, well, I, I think uh, I've got it down in time that if a grenade came, that I could cover it. And he said, hey, man, uh, you're crazy. He said, no, like three to five seconds, you know. I think I could do it. He said, that, that, would, that would never happen. Well, tragically, not uh, too long after, he was able to confirm it. And as a grenade came towards uh, Corporal Dunham and his Marines, in the ultimate act of sacrifice, in the ultimate manifestation of love. He covered the grenade. Perhaps this is, uh, we can distill this concept, this manifestation of love, uh, down to kind of a single passage from John 15. And that greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. These sacrifices are so other-oriented. So we started this, this talk asking, you know, exploring the warrior ethos from Dr. King's passage. It's so transcendent to the selfish self-preservation that we all commonly know. And it all comes down to a willingness to sacrifice the self for the greater good the rest of your team. And so, when we explore the warrior ethos, uh, I think we should focus in on, if there's, if there's one foundational, if there's one imperative about the warrior ethos that we take away, more than anything, be, being a warrior is an expression of love uh, for your brothers. Stay in the fight. Keep attacking. Stay savage.